Okay, um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm uh, Jose Pacheco, I'm with CTL Group, a consulting and testing firm uh, located in Chicago in the United States. And this presentation is um, a practitioner's perspective on how to um, consider shrinkage and other uh, early age uh, properties uh, in construction projects here in North America that I believe are uh, similar or could be applicable to other parts of the world as well. Um, this presentation is composed of four sections. Uh, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about uh, specification considerations for uh, shrinkage of concrete. And then I'm going to talk about the effect of material selection and show some case studies on different types of concrete performance of different concrete mixtures. Um, then follow up with some recommendations uh, for not only the designer, but the contractor as well, and some conclusions uh, finally. Um, so in, in the traditional construction process or design and construction process, I'm, this specification will, uh, this uh, presentation will cover the specification development performance requirements section, which is part of the design, uh, development of contract documents and et cetera. And also uh, touch on the qualification and um, selection and laboratory testing of concrete mixtures for particular applications. So the construction and post-construction uh, parts of a, a infrastructure project are, are not going to be included here. Um, in, in North America, major infrastructure projects uh, often specify shrinkage performance because uh, the need for controlling cracks in uh, projects such as bridge decks, tunnels, retaining walls, etc. It's critical not only for uh, serviceability or aesthetic considerations, but also for uh, preventing moisture, chlorides, etc., from uh, penetrating the concrete and uh, reducing the durability of particular structures. Um, it is still the case that, uh, yet that um, in 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 it's frequently that um, shrinkage uh, issues occur in bridge deck construction uh, very uh, often. Uh, that often spark the need for uh, in situ investigations and some laboratory testing or, or destructive testing of, of uh, cores that can show signs where uh, the shrinkage or volumetric changes of that particular concrete led to uh, undesired or uncontrolled cracks. Uh, on the right hand side, I just showed a bridge deck, and now I'm showing a an example of two cores and one of those cores is shown here with the typical uh, shrinkage cracking uh, features. Um, so it's very important that projects in which uh, volumetric changes can lead to undesirable crack, the specification language is very clear. And it also includes uh, different uh, methodologies as to how to evaluate that performance in an adequate manner in the qualification stage so that in the construction and the placement portions of the project, these pro projects are not uh, recurring. Uh, now I'm showing a, an image of a classic wall over slab uh, situation where you have some uh, retain sh uh, restrained shrinkage cracking, uh, both in a vertical direction and also on a diagonal direction towards the end of the wall. So the first part of uh, the, the main issue is how do we specify and evaluate uh, shrinkage performance? This may sound uh, simplistic based on the other presentations that were part of this um, session, but in practice, it's still an important step to consider because crack-free concrete is, is very difficult to guarantee. And in often cases, the uh, addressing the cracking uh, of concrete in, in place is so often uh, placed on the shoulders of the builder or contractor squarely, where in some cases the design could have been uh, better to address for that. Um, typical specification requirements uh, are twofold. One is the classic free shrinkage of unrestrained conditions. Uh, this is a uh, thing very similar to uh, some of the European methods where you just have a concrete prism and you just measure the uh, initial length and length over time of that prism to determine the changes due to shrinkage at laboratory conditions. 
in uh, uh, typically uh, in the United States, I, I would say that um, requirements of a maximum shrinkage of 500 micro strength, which is 0.05% uh, change in length after 28 days of drying are typical. In some specialized cases that may be reduced to about 300 um, and there could be a varied reasons for that, such as reduced curing. Um, it could be a highly restrained or um, a repair, for instance, it's a, it's a very typical uh, requirement in that case. And uh, different from Europe, uh, laboratory conditions in the United States are at 23 Celsius and 50% relative humidity. So this uh, sketch and these figures just show the classic C150, uh, ASTM C157 setup uh, for measuring uh, free shrinkage. In the case of restrained shrinkage uh, in North America, the ring test has been uh, predominantly used. Um, this is a, uh, a, a test that requires uh, concrete rings to be made in which an, an inner uh, steel uh, ring is instrumented with some strain gauges to measure the uh, strain development of the concrete over time. And, also, and, and these uh, rings are all subject to the same environmental conditions uh, after, uh, after one day so that the drying of the concrete is the driving mechanism for the volumetric changes of that concrete over time. And typically the specification languages that include uh, the ring test are uh, addressing how long it will take for a set of rings to crack based on the material performance and also the uh, table shown here for an ASTM C 1581 that classifies concrete performance on four, or four levels of potential for cracking, depending on the net time to cracking from fabrication up, up until the rings are cracked from, uh, let's say uh, under a week and probably 28 days or greater. Um, now I'm gonna move forward to how the material selection and laboratory evaluation uh, or case studies can, can uh, uh, aid in uh, identifying what are the proportions and, and, and the performance that will lead to uh, desirable uh, volumetric uh, performance in, in various projects. Uh, optimized concrete mixtures in uh, North America, this is a, a very important step uh, because of the availability of materials uh, that any project can have. Uh, often provide the uh, ability for the ready mix concrete supplier or contractor to choose different cementation materials and, and, and mix them together at the batch plant. In Europe, uh, uh, the use of blended cements is more prominent. So there uh, doesn't necessarily mean that there are less options, but it's typically um, uh, one region will have a particular type of cement and that's what it's used. Um, nevertheless, uh, optimizing your mixture can come from uh, not only what type of cement is used, but also the level, uh, the amount of cementitious paste, like in, in this example shown here. This is the, the portion of the hardened concrete that will suffer the volumetric changes. So uh, coming up with the optimal volume of cementitious paste is critical for, uh, in this particular case, shrinkage, but it would be the same for other volumetric uh, performance such as creep. Uh, but that it, it has to be understood that uh, minimizing cementitious space, although it may be advantageous for machine performance, may um, not be ideal for other uh, requirements such as pumping or finishing and, and other um, important steps of the construction process so that um, the these other uh, performance requirements are not inadvertently uh, affected by reducing the cementitious space uh, very much. Um, so all the benefits of optimized concrete mixtures are improved constructability, I already uh, discussed that, less heat of hydration, um, lower potential for cracking, this, which is the focus of this presentation, improved durability and sustainability, and in most cases also reduces the costs. Um, I'm going to show now two case studies, uh, the first one, uh, it's the comparison of two concrete mixtures that have uh, alternary blends. Uh, one is with uh, Portland cement, slag cement, and silica fume. And the replacement of Portland cement in this particular case was 45% of total uh, mass. 
In the second case, it was a 33% uh, replacement of Portland cement by mass, and this mixture had a combination of cement, fly ash, and silica film. And the corresponding ASTM specifications are shown in the table. Both mixtures, both mixtures have the exact same cementitious content, exact same water cement uh, ratio, water content, etc., and the paste volume, which is, uh, like I mentioned already, is critical for uh, shrinkage performance. And we uh, did um, different curing regimes, uh, ranging from one, three, seven, and twenty-eight days of most curing, and then we just measure the uh, uh, free shrinkage of these mixtures, which is, which are now shown here in these two charts. So uh, the first thing I think is, is, is clearly uh, visible is that even though they have the same cementitious paste content, cementitious uh, uh, material content and water cement ratio, these two concretes can perform very differently. Um, in the upper uh, portion, the mixture with a higher uh, cementitious uh, or Portland cement replacement was obviously more uh, sensitive to the duration of the moist curing, as you can be seen on these four uh, different uh, lines uh, showing the difference from once, three, seven, and 28 days in the overall uh, change in length. Uh, and obviously the second uh, mixture with a slightly uh, less uh, or, or lower percentage of uh, portland cement replacement was less sensitive to the uh, overall shrinkage, uh, sorry, overall curing uh, duration. As I mentioned in, this, uh, in the first section, 0.05 would be a typical requirement after 20 days of drying. So this line can show which uh, material and curing conditions can lead to a satisfactory performance um, for a typical specification requirement. And if it's a specialized application, this uh, line at uh, uh, 300 microns will show that some materials can achieve that, but they will require a uh, uh, perhaps a in this particular case a higher percentage of uh, Portland cement replacement. But the curing will have to be uh, increased or uh, conducted in such a way in which will allow that performance to to be satisfactory. Um, the second case study is a comparison of four different mixtures for the restrained uh, shrinkage uh, testing. Um, these are not identical, but they're very close to each other. Uh, and the cementitious content range from 390 to uh, 397 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. The water cement ratio was the same for two of them and slightly different for the others when accounting for um, a styrene butadiene latex modifier and one of the mixtures uh, was just the control, which is a ternary blend without the latex or a shrinkage that reducing admixture, which is uh, labeled as this ray. And the uh, performance of restrained shrinkage is shown here uh, for each mixture that can show that obviously some of them are more resistant to the, not only the time to cracking, but also the strain rate development. Uh, uh, in the particular case of the control mixture, we, uh was only a ternary blend. Um, the cracking, the average cracking uh, duration was in the order of 10 days. With the use of uh, shrinkage reducing, reducing admixture, that could be increased uh, significantly, um, but still would not achieve uh, 28 days. And when the um, latex modified mixtures were used, these would perform uh, in a even better and 20 days without cracking was, um, was possible. Um, so using the table from ASTM C1581, it's clear that the uh, high potential for cracking, which is shown in the red shaded portion, moderate high and moderate low are are clearly, can be clearly uh, used for identification of which concrete mixture uh, is probably recommended for a particular project, depending on the specification requirements and the materials that are available for that particular um, job. And this is a very uh, useful uh, test method for evaluating uh, that purpose. And this table just shows the uh, mean time to cracking uh, and some of the um, strain and stress rate uh, Per, uh, metrics of these four charts that I just showed. 
Um, recommendations, um, these are general, but in, in my experience, specification language is critical. Um, it, is, it, it is very important that the designer and specifier understands that uh, coming up with a mitigation plan and, and the uh, performance of a in-place structure starts there. And it's not only a responsibility of the contractor to uh, achieve a crack-free uh, or mitigate the cracking as much as possible. Uh, is, it is recommended to limit shrinkage and not the water cement ratio or the cementitious content, because like I showed already, there, there are different ways depending on what materials any are available in a particular region uh, to achieve those specification requirements. So limiting material, uh, proportions or, 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 or water cement ratio is perhaps not the way to come up with uh, adequate or acceptable shrinkage performance. Um, tolerance for cracking. Um, obviously some projects can live with uh, some uh, cracking like the, one, like the ones I've shown. In some cases for uh, uh, leakage uh, or water tightness, this may not be uh, appropriate or even allowed. Uh, but in some cases, uh, some cracking, some level of cracking can can be acceptable. Um, from a specifier's perspective, uh, make make sure that there's no conflicting direction with regards to repair. Sometimes uh, specification languages uh, uh, understand that cracks uh, do occur, and then that there are uh, specified means and methods to uh, repair those cracks, but those then may not be. Uh, acceptable from a durability uh, or service life perspective. So um, making sure that all the parts of a specification document are, are, uh, are, are connected and are synchronized is critical. And from the owner uh, aspect, also understand that um, con the, the construction process can, can, can widely de vary depending on environmental conditions and material supply and availability. So um, this is an important part to consider so that delays and not causing um, liquidated damages or other sort of or more construction um, uh, logistics and, and budgeting uh, aspects. Um, finally, um, I just wanted to um, finish this uh, very pragmatic presentation on some key considerations for avoiding um, uh, some uh, it, cracking uh, in, in, in any type of project. Um, understanding that shrinkage is, is, can be critical for some structures and should not be over, overlooked in terms of uh, what are the requirements for that particular case. Uh, understand that constructability issues are undesired, but in some ways inevitable. Um, like I mentioned already, it, it, it is not, not as easy as it sounds to uh, place concrete um, in, in various conditions, but if you have a, an optimized concrete mixture that is very robust and can cover all the specification requirements, that is the solution to the problem and, 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 the con and coming up with that mixture itself, it should not be the problem. Uh, constructability, uh, it, it makes a big difference if you're placing that concrete with a pump or with a, 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 a tailgate or a chute or a bucket. So understanding how those uh, steps that are part of the construction process uh, uh, affect the performance or the selection of concrete mixture is paramount. And finally, understanding wh what, at what point punting is perhaps the best way and sometimes repair may be too complicated, too laborious or too expensive and sometimes replacement is, is the way to go, but also understand that there's obviously cost and sustainability aspects associated with that, that uh, I need to be considered. And with that, I'm gonna finish my presentation.